Welcome to the Chapel Hill Library. I'm Larry D'Amico, and I'm the curator of the gallery. Um, so we're all here to celebrate. Ben. And I never met him, but I saw the work, and whether it had a personal story or not, I looked at the artwork, and I see a world-class photographer. And I was thrilled to be able to work with this. And I know all of you have personal relationships with the family. I did not know him, as I said, but it's, it's just a thrill to have the show here. And we're all here to celebrate that work. So I'll pass it on. Thanks, Larry. Thanks, man. Um, before we get started, I'm just going to do a little intro here. Um, there are a lot of reasons why I wanted to do this event at this Chappaqua Library. Um, I hounded, I'm not sure if you're aware of Larry, but I harassed them for many weeks until they agreed. So thanks for agreeing to do it here. Um, and thank you to Larry. Um, Larry helped put together that amazing exhibit out there, so thank you. Um, yeah, when I first spoke to Larry, actually, he told me that he was in the middle of reframing a photo that my dad took that had been hanging in the library when I was a kid. So it felt like a very serendipitous moment. And, and actually, it's on the board right now. So. Um, yeah, so my dad built community here in Chappaqua. Um, he captured every Little League opening day. You see that photo out there where he was up in a crane photographing children. He was the town's go-to photographer for family portraits. I remember seeing a lot of random families from my middle school in my basement all the time. And then I'd see my basement on their walls. Um, so it was, you know, it was really important for me to do this event here in Chappaqua. Um, and I wanted you all to kind of re-experience coming to this town that I know most of you came to quite often when we lived here. Um, I also need to send uh, a thank you to the Hemophilia Association of New York. Um, my dad was a board member of that group for 20 years, and they actually funded the gallery exhibit. So um, I just want to send a, a huge thank you to, to you guys for that. Um, this project has been an incredibly enormous undertaking. It's taken up a lot of my time and my energy. Um, you know, it's not just the book, it's turned into a talk, a workshop, um, the Kickstarter campaign, the website, the printing, the selling, there's just so much. It's gone on and on. And I have to say that none of this would be at all possible with the help of my wife, Katie. So <clears throat> I'm just going to share with you a short list, not that short, of the things that she's done to put this together. Firstly, several years of talking to me at length about every single idea that I had for this book. Um, she's just been a guide for my thinking for, on all of this. Um, she's edited basically every word I've ever written, which includes the book, the Kickstarter, all my social media posts, the hundreds of emails that I've sent out to promote this book, and Sometimes just the words that come out of my mouth. <laughs> um, Katie created the physical storyboards that eventually turned into the order of the text in the book. She produced and edited the video that brought the Kickstarter its success. She fulfilled every single Kickstarter prize, which included ordering, packaging, and sending several hundred photos and books. Um, and yeah, so we, we started with the photos and now with the books. Um, We've got a whole assembly line, which my mother has also been very helpful with. Um, Katie listened to and edited my talk and my workshop dozens of times. Um, and I just want to add that most of this was done while she was pregnant and mothering our daughter, Elsmer. Um, and she also framed every single photo you see out there. Um, anyway, that's, that's the short list. Um, so through all of this, you know, she's helped me bring this project to life. Um, but she's also developed a relationship with my dad through this. And 
it's it's beautiful. So give it up. Um, for those of you who have a book in your hand, I just want to kind of talk about the cover because there's a lot to it. Um, first of all, I chose this image because I love the rawness of it. I love that my dad is shirtless, but he's still covered up by his camera. It tells me that there's a lot of raw emotion in this book, and we'll have to connect to that emotion. Sorry, connect that emotion to his photography in order to understand it. One of the things I talk about in this book is my dad's silence around his illnesses and his looming death. He just didn't talk about it, and he avoided the topic. And I think in a sense he was hiding behind his camera. And his camera and his photos were the only way to see and hear what he was feeling and going through. I also love the image, as many of you, as many of you know, sorry, as many of you who knew my dad know that to remember him is basically to remember seeing this. We often didn't see his face because there was a camera in front of it all the time. My dad had a bleeding disorder and I wanted this to be represented as well. And so the image bleeds to the edge of the cover and it also bleeds to the side and, and to the back. I wanted to have the word unburying on top so that it makes you pause and view all that's in between before you get to my father. There's so much unburying to do, and that has been done inside this book. And I wanted the title and the design to reflect that. I chose to have a non-laminated cover because the story inside this book is not smooth. It's not easy, and it's a difficult journey. And I wanted the cover to have a bit of roughness some texture to reflect that. At the start of this entire project, I wanted to just share my dad's photography because I think it's incredible. It's unique and beautiful. To really share it with a wider audience, it needed a backstory. And wow, did it ever get one that I was not expecting. I did not intend to be vulnerable and share in the way that I am. But I'm so grateful that it turned out that way. And an incredible result of this project is that we've kind of become interdependent. In order to share his photos, he needs me to tell the story. And in order to tell his, his story, I really need his photos. So lastly, this book would not have at all have been possible without all the contributors of stories from my dad's family and friends. Um, you all have facilitated a life-altering transformation in me, and so I'm, I'm just forever grateful. And so, for today's reading, I've asked many of the contributors to sit with me, hold me up, and um, read together. So, let's start some, some reading. Um, as we go through, um, for those of you that have a book, I'm going to name the page. I'd love for you to go to the page so that you see the image that goes along with the text. Page 10, Grandmaster, my brother. I'm standing on the shore, looking out onto the ocean. It isn't a pristine white sand beach with no water. It is brown, dark, dirty looking sand, and the water is dark green. I have a palpable feeling of calmness. It's sunny, I hear the waves crashing, out of the corner of my right eye, I see a figure approaching. No face or distinct, distinguishable features, just a black silhouette of a person running toward me. Before I can turn to see who it is, this person plunges a knife into my chest. I wake up. It's about 3 a.m. I go back to sleep and wake up again at 6 a.m. and I hear my mom talking in hushed tones in the basement. I knew Dad had died. I went downstairs. She was on the phone with my grandparents. She hung up promptly and we embraced. I think now that the feeling of tranquility in my dream was one last gift of peace before I woke up into my reality, before being on the other side of the great focal point of my life. Page 14. Several people, including my grandparents, told me that they did not know where my dad's interest in photography came from. My dad participated in life as much as he could, but because of his physical limitations, he couldn't fully engage. 
Akin to having a heightened sense of hearing if you are blind, I think that his observation skills were sharpened by being on the sidelines and watching others move through the world in a way that he was not able to. This translates to the camera lens. I believe that once he picked up a camera, he was naturally skilled at identifying and capturing elements of everyday life in a meaningful and artful way. Page 24. My dad was born on July 6, 1947, in Woodbridge, New Jersey. He was raised by his parents, Morty and Eleanor Masser, known to everyone as Guenel. He was very close to his cousins and neighbors. Although he had friends and was very active, my dad was physically limited due to his hemophilia, and his parents worried about him constantly. Um, so for this next quote, which is also on page 24, uh, it's taken from an audio recording that I, um, from a conversation I had with my grandmother, and I thought it would be apt to have uh, Katie, my wife, who is obviously a new mother, um, read it. So she's, Katie's going to come up and read my grandmother's words. I went over to Randy's crib and I picked him up. He had had his circumcision, and all I saw was a crib full of blood. I was 19 years old. What the hell did I know about anything like that? What did I know about bringing up a child? I was married, we didn't have a car, and I lived with my in-laws. I woke them up and told them what happened. I said, listen to me, get on the phone and call a taxi cab because we're going to the hospital. And then I called his pediatrician who lived right across the street from us and worked at Beth Israel Hospital. I'll never forget it as long as we live. I called him and I told him what I had found. He said he would meet us at the hospital. When we pulled up, he grabbed a hold of Randy the doctor had his pajamas on under his pants. He didn't even change when he heard what happened. Of course, our family had all decided that the rabbi had made a big mistake, that he had cut Randy. That's not what happened. When the doctor came down to talk to us, he said, I hate to tell you this, but he is a bleeder. He's a hemophiliac. He tried to explain it to us, and from that day on, my whole life changed. I ended up taking Randy to the Beth Israel blood doctor, and all he did was make my son scream by giving him shots. They didn't know what they were doing. They didn't know very much about hemophilia. Eventually, I got a notice about a hemophilia organization, and I joined. That's when I started to learn what hemophilia was, that I was a genetic carrier, and that my mother was also a carrier. When we found out, we had, we had been thinking about having another child, but I said, no, I can't do that. I can't bring another child into the world. And so we decided to arrange to adopt a little girl, but that never happened. That was the smartest decision we ever made, because Randy needed care. And if I had to give all of my attention to my son and not my daughter, it would have been a horror. At least we were smart enough not to do that. Page 36. Uh, I'm going to read something that, uh, in addition to unburying photos, I unburied a lot of documents and old letters. And I found a letter written to my grandmother on the eve of my dad's bar mitzvah from his rabbi. So this, this is the words of my, my, parent, my dad's family's rabbi. Dear Eleanor, only today on the brink of your son Randy's bar mitzvah, I reread your letter to me. Not only did I find an honest evaluation of your situation and relationship toward Jewish practices, but I also detected forthright doubt as to the dispensing of justice by our creator. Your description of Randy's condition struck me as having the quality of an anguished cry for help and perplexity. Oh, how I wish that I could be a guide to the perplexed. Sometimes, when people turn to me with perhaps some justified questions as to, why is God doing this to me? I, a rabbi, am possessed with profound faith in God. I'm endeavoring to infuse a bit of trust and hope for a better future. At times, I am even skeptical if my words are acceptable. Perhaps the one laden with a heavy burden thinks, how can more words help me? No, I do not profess that religion and faith heal all the brokenhearted. However, I say, those who give God a chance and look unto him for strength and comfort are seldom disappointed. I sincerely hope and pray that the Almighty may watch over Randy, keep him in good health, and cause him to bring joy and happiness to you. I feel that God can and will make it up to you for causing you so much concern over your son. 
I hope that my wishes for you will be fulfilled, and in the future we will share together in God's abundant blessings. With kindest personal regards and a hearty mazel tov to all of you, your rabbi and friend. Page 40. After graduating from high school in 1965, my dad enrolled at CW Post College in Brookville, New York. He met a group of people there who remained among his closest friends until the day he died. <clears throat> Page 48, these are the words of Adrian Buckles, who was my dad's friend from college, read by her daughter, Amanda. We were in the Pathmark supermarket near CW Post. Mandy and I were talking. He told me he did not expect to live to be 30 and knew he would never be married or have children. Page 50. After graduating from college in 1969, my dad moved to Manhattan where he lived with his friend from college, Tony. He worked for a record label, dated, and had an active social life. He continued to receive regular treatment for his hemophilia at the Lenox Hill Hospital as well as the Hemophilia Treatment Center at Mount Sinai Hospital. This is Tony Licata, <coughs> my dad's college friend and his roommate in New York. <coughs> Randy used to lean on the windowsill of our apartment several floors up, look down at the people walking by, and just start talking to strangers. One time, we drove up to Boston, we hit some traffic. Randy rolled down his window, started talking to the guy in the car next to us. And he said, here, and gave the guy an apple. It's just out of nowhere. That's just who Randy was. He would just connect. Randy once had one of his attacks, an internal bleeding episode, and he couldn't walk. So I literally carried him out of the apartment. We went down the elevator, and then I carried him and put him into a taxi, and then I literally carried him into the hospital. Page 52, Susan Goldman, my dad's friend. In the summer of 1971, <coughs> we were hanging at Randy and Tony's apartment, and Randy said, order a pizza in a half hour, and I'll be back when it's delivered. Where are you going, we asked. To the hill, and Excel hospital, he responded. We'll go with you, we said, and we did. It was quiet in the emergency room, and the woman at the desk looked up and said, hi, Randy. What do you need? He told her, and she said it would be just a few minutes. When he got called in, he turned to us and said, Now, go get the pizza, and I'll meet you back at the apartment. He had his, his timing down right. Although I knew he had hemophilia, this was the first time it actually ever came up. Page 60, Maria Licata, my dad's friend, and Tony Licata's wife. I met Randy a few weeks after meeting Tony on the Fire Island Ferry in 1973. At that time, Randy was working in the recording business. He was a music geek. He was Tony's roommate on York and 72nd. It was a one bedroom with two single beds. They had nothing in their fridge but a pitcher of water. When they'd sleep over, they'd go down to the deli to get me coffee in the morning. I still remember Randy in his bed loudly getting comfortable, yawning and stretching, always a funny ordeal. It all seemed to culminate in a chorus of farts, <laughs> which were quite memorable. Randy had a male admirer in the building who loved to do his laundry for him. <laughs> Page 66, Dan Couture, my dad's friend from college. Uh, December 1st, 1973 was the day that Bright's wedding to Adrian on Long Island, New York. They had a reception at Adrian's mother's place and then an after party at a hotel on Central Park South in Manhattan. It did not take long before the party started to roar. As the consumption of refreshments grew, the no noise level a few phone calls from the hotel desk passing on complaints from the adjacent guests promoted some efforts to be quiet, but it was too late. The suite had a lost cause. 
bedroom, the bedroom had become a side show of the party, members using substances, and it was fully trashed. By the time the house detective arrived, the group was considered for some non grata at the hotel. We all got kicked out. This was inconvenient for the attendees, but what were Bryce and Adrian going to do? They were supposed to stay in the suite for their first night of their honeymoon. The group gathered their things. Randy provided another key to another suite in the hotel that he had reserved in advance and was ready for the new Page 75. After a few years of working in the music industry, my dad eventually developed an interest in photography and was accepted to the Germain School of Photography in downtown Manhattan. He completed the program in 1975 and began a career as a freelance photographer. He did commercial and, and industrial shoots, portraits, family photos, and loved photographing life on the streets and sidewalks in New York City. His business was simply called Randy Master Photography. He never left home without a camera. Page 128, Eileen Master, my mom. In 1976, I was taking a course in social work school called The Emotional Impact of Chronic Illness. As part of the course, we met with patients in the healthcare setting who had talked to us about their illness. There was a hemophilia clinic at Mount Sinai Hospital, and on that day, Marvin Gilbert your dad's orthopedist, was seeing him routinely as he did. We learned about hemophilia, how the chronic episodes of bleeding lead to arthritis, swollen and stiff joints, limited range of motion. Marvin was showing us your dad's knees. Sometime after the class, your dad asked the social worker at the clinic if he could get my phone number from the professor. <laughs> he called and we went out for the first time several weeks later. I already knew he had hemophilia, so there was no, not an issue with him having to disclose. But I did not know how much about his illness, and I was concerned that he could bleed to death. I have to admit that it was not love at first sight. Rather, I grew to love your dad as I got to know him better. He was very funny, had a huge network of friends, was generous in love photography. After we had dated for about three months, your dad told me he didn't want to continue to see me. I was taken by surprise and responded by asking him how long his previous relationships had lasted. And guess what? No more than three months. I asked him if he saw a pattern. And if this might have something, <laughs> and if this might have something to do with his own issues, more than it had to do with me. I guess it made him to some reflection, needless to say, we continued to see each other. I moved in with your dad after we had been dating a year. Gu and Al were very happy for their son and for me. My parents did not show any concern about his hemophilia. I don't think they really understood what it meant to have hemophilia. Instead, they were furious that we would be living together because um, we weren't married. <laughs> I got pregnant and terminated the pregnancy. I think this brought us closer together as a couple. Your dad proposed to me in Symphony Space Movie Theater in Manhattan after seeing Woody Guthrie's movie Found for Glory. <laughs> I guess he identified with the title of the movie. It wasn't romantic, no down on me thing, but loving in earnest. We married on June 18, 1978. This was monumental for your dad. From a young age, he believed his hemophilia would deprive him of his whole life and he did not believe he would live past the age of 30, be married, or have a family. He was 30 years old when we married. I was 28. Page 40. My dad believed that he would never marry me, and he did. He didn't think he'd live past the age of 30, and he did. He also never thought he would have children. In 1982, my brother Graham was born, followed by me in 1985. In 1987, we moved out of our Brooklyn, New York apartment to a house in the wooded suburbs of Chappaqua, New York. My dad turned the basement of our house into his studio and darkroom and remained living and working in this home until he died. Page 158, 
Ed Rogoff, my dad's friend whom he met as a teenager at the Mount Sinai Hemophilia Treatment Center, and with whom he worked as a fellow board member of the Hemophilia Association of New York. In late 1981, or early 1982, all the patients from the Hemophilia Treatment Center at Mount Sinai were invited to a presentation about this new disease that was called Acquired Immune Deficiency Syndrome, AIDS. The early reports were very scary. Patients presenting with unusual symptoms and never seeing diseases were resisting all treatments and dying quickly. What started with discussions of gay men being most at risk was quickly brought in to include people with hemophilia. I met, uh, I went with Randy and another friend, Barry Webster. I sat between them in a large auditorium that held about 100 people that day. The doctors sat on the stage in front of us. The room was electric with fear. The doctor's message was simple. Don't stop using Factor. It's too early to know if Factor was a means of transmission. They said this over and over. They didn't know what was causing this disease of AIDS, but they did know that not using Factor was dangerous to people with hemophilia. We three guys in our 30s, Sitting there that afternoon were old pros at the healthcare system. Among the three of us, we probably had a couple hundred hospitalizations and a couple thousand emergency room visits. We trusted doctors, but not entirely. We had all lived most of our lives without Factor, which had only been around for 10 years at that point, and we could live again without it. How we reacted to this presentation says a great deal about each of us. As a general personality trait, Barry was the most intense of us. He had a sharp personality and wit. I don't recall seeing him smile or laugh much. His anger towards the medical personnel was palpable. He was smart and charming when he wanted to be, but he deeply resented how hemophilia prevented him from living the life he wanted. AIDS took Barry down quickly. In a few years, I would be wiping my tears <laughs> at his funeral. I was the most <clears throat> so <laughs> I was the most analytical of our trio. They don't know anything, I said. I felt comfortable not using Factor unless absolutely necessary, and I would not use Factor or even be tested for HIV for the next six years. When I did get tested, I was mercifully negative. Randy was the most mature, perhaps most evolved. He was not gripped by fear, but or overcome by anger, or hiding in denial. He took it all in was even able to make some sotto voce jokes about the doctors, and he took a wait and see attitude. Randy took plenty of punches, and yet always rose to find happiness where he could. This trait of Randy's made me feel incredibly comfortable in his company. There was a quiet wisdom to him that I have never seen in anyone else. Of course, he didn't like being sick, but he made the best of it. Somehow, he was playing this game on a higher level than most of us. Page 165. <laughs> in the late 1970s, my dad became a board member of the Hemophilia Association of New York. He remained on the board until the day he died, and even served as the vice president for a period. He advocated for policies to protect and benefit individuals with hemophilia. He led support groups for young adults with bleeding disorders, and he was often asked to counsel individuals and their families. He never missed a board meeting. Page 166, I leave. 
When your dad got the HIV results, we went to the hemophilia treatment center at Mount Sinai Hospital. They talked to us about his T cell count, and they gave us some hope in terms of new medications being developed. He didn't tell people initially because there was a myth that even if you shook hands, the, the HIV would be easily transmitted. We were furious at the pharmaceutical companies, but more so, we were scared. Scared about what this meant in terms of his, mine, and our son's mortality. Page 174. I was in the fifth grade and my dad showed up unannounced to school one day and took Graham and me out, citing a family emergency to the school administration. As soon as I got into the old gray sob, he revealed that we had tickets to go to opening day at Yankee Stadium. <laughs> I was beyond thrilled. After sitting through traffic, we finally made it to the parking lot. As we were about to close the trunk, he realized that he had locked the keys in the car. Yeah. So he had me squeeze through an extremely small opening between the trunk and the back seat and grab the keys. I felt very proud that I was able to help. We watched the game with delight and were entertained by the public drunkenness and total sports mayhem. There was a man passed out a few rows ahead of us, and his friend asked everyone in our section to pass him their empty beer cups. My dad happily passed his along, and this man stacked about 30 cups on his friend's head without making them up. Our whole section went wild. My dad just laughed his way through the entire day. Page 192. Our lives remained relatively normal on the outside, filled with sports, summer camp, family vacations, and holidays. But there was a darker side to our reality as my dad's health began to decline. My mom only got tested for HIV for the first time in 1996, 10 years after my dad tested positive. After she tested negative, they decided to tell people and us. Page 192 again, Grant. I've been thinking lately about how mom and dad kept this secret for so long. They knew he had HIV AIDS basically right after you were born, but didn't tell us for over 10 years. That's a long time to keep a secret of that magnitude, and it must have informed every waking hour and every decision they made. What incredible stress and fear to bear. Page 200, Susan Cowan, my parents' friend. Stephen and I were standing in the kitchen with Randy and he told us that he was contracted with HIV. It broke our hearts. He was so worried about you, Beth, and your mom. He had a positive attitude, but he was also scared shitless. From that day on, we grew even closer. Page 202, Ida Doctor, my mom's cousin. As the disease progressed, Randy became more symptomatic. My daughters were questioning me when they saw his legs. Telling them was very difficult, and we all cried together. <clears throat> Page 210, I think. Your dad and I would talk about the illness, but we did not talk about him dying. The last two years of his life were difficult for him in terms of feeling hopeful, <coughs> because he was getting more and more infections. My job was to keep him motivated and positive. Page 228, Grant. Dad and I spent a lot of time driving to and from school, sports, and band practice. We often sat in silence. It felt awkward, like we both wanted to talk, but weren't sure what to say. Page 230, The last year of his life was the most difficult. His body was wasting away, and he would become short of breath all the time. He cried when his hair fell out as a side effect of medication. Symbolically, it was a culmination of a lot of losses he had to face, including the prospect of losing his family and not being there for the course. Page 232, Julia Reichman, the daughter of my dad's friend from college. Last weekend, Randy had my family and other close friends over for a day. He asked everyone to go down to the basement because he had something to show us. Over the next few hours, Randy took us on a photographic journey through the slides he accumulated from the past 30 years. He pressed the button to release the slides on the projector. Each picture brought a smile to everyone's face in that room. Pictures of old friends and pictures of their children. His face was radiant. He was beaming and wasn't afraid to let everyone know it. This slideshow was Randy's way of saying goodbye. 
He knew that his, that his time was running out, that he was not going to just fade away. Everyone who was there that day can recall Randy's smile and his laughter. He glowed as if a light bulb had been planted into his body. Page 235. In December 1999, my dad's health deteriorated significantly. He was very weak, but remained cheerful, funny, and participated in family events and dinners. On December 26, 1999, he was admitted to Mount Sinai Hospital in Manhattan. Despite his ailing state, he was discharged home on December 31st. I was scared, but when he came back home, I was hopeful that it was not serious. I wanted to stay home with him on New Year's Eve, but my parents told me I should keep my plans and spend the night with my friends, so I did. The next few days at home did not go well for my dad. He was readmitted to the hospital on January 4th. He was in immense pain and on a lot of medications, which made it hard for us to communicate with him. The night before my dad died, I was in his hospital room, sitting on his bed and holding his hand. I told him I loved him, but he was in and out of consciousness. His eyes were opening and closing. He was having trouble keeping his head straight on his shoulders. I could tell he was trying for me, but the disease and the meds had taken their toll. When I walked out, I was in a daze. My mom asked me if I was scared that he was going to die. I cried in her arms. I said yes. On January 6, 2000, my dad died from AIDS-related illnesses at 52 years old. I was 14 and Graham was 17. Page 236, Graham. After I heard mom on the phone and knew dad had died, I went back into my room, got into bed, cried and lay there, not sure what to do. After an hour, I got back up, and Mom and I went to your room to wake you up to tell you. You started crying in a way that was just so awful and guttural, pure agony. It was horrible to hear. The three of us just lay there for a while, crying in your bed. Gu and Al came in the house while we were there, and both of them just collapsed on top of us. We were just a huddled mess of unbridled grief. Stephen Cowan came over and consoled us. I lay there crying, and he told me that he made a promise to Dad to always look after us, and that he always would. Page 237. My mom and brother woke me up at 6 a.m. and told me the news that I feared was coming. My dad died early that morning at the hospital. It took a few minutes to sink in. Then the sensation I felt was as if someone stepped on my heart, applied pressure with a big boot, and did not let up. As my only defense, I cradled myself in my bed and cried and screamed for many hours. In the fleeting moments of actual thought, all I could do was wonder how my life could possibly continue. It felt like the end. Three weeks after I turned 14, I wrote my eulogy for my dad's funeral. I was not able to read it in front of a large crowd of people, so I had a family friend, Stephen Cowan, read it, read it for me. Today, um, there's a lot of people in this room that were at that funeral, and I'm going to take an opportunity to redeem myself, and I'm going to read it for you today. Dear Father, I know you are in a better place now where no illness may harm you. I am proud of you, Father. You fought for yourself and your family as best you could for 15 years. You are the bravest and strongest man I will ever know. I am a fighter like you. Everything that I had in you, I now have in me. I have your strength and love in me, your intelligence and your loving heart inside of me, your will to live, your strength to never give up, and kindness and love towards others. I have this and more, all from you, Father. And from this, I realize you are not only my role model, but my hero in life. It makes me so proud and so happy 
when all of your friends and family tell me how great a man you are, how great a son, how great a dad you are, and how great a husband you are, and how everyone who knows you loves you, and how you never had anything bad to say about anyone. We are all going to miss you, Father, but you will be with us all the time. You will be with me and Graham to help guide us through our lives, and you will be here to guide Mom when she needs help. And you will guide your parents to live the rest of their lives to the fullest. I love you more than anyone else on this entire earth. I want to thank you for all the years of happiness, sadness, and laughter you have given us. These years will never be forgotten. I promise you that. I love you so much, Dad, your son, Sandra. Page 35, Inara de Leon, my neighbor in Chappaqua. One morning after Randy died, I was in that in-between state of consciousness, just waking up, but then drifting back again. I had the most intense feeling of Randy's presence, warm and yellow, and accepting in such a profound way. It felt almost like touching Godness. I was overcome with tears. I felt comfort from the moment, but also sorrow. I still tear up when I think of him. Page 252. During the year after my dad died, I was in a state of depression and anger inside our house. I moped, watched TV, slept, smoked weed, and I had no patience for my mother's concern for me. A few nights a week, she would sit Graham and me down to do what she called heart checks. She would ask us how we were doing emotionally. I was really reserved in terms of sharing how I felt. This was also true during the talk therapy sessions and bereavement groups that I went to. Sitting and talking about my experience was very difficult for me, and it still is. My in-home depression worsened after Graham went off to college the following year. My mom believes that I was depressed at home because that is where I felt safe to feel sad and angry. Outside the home, I was generally okay, very sociable, and enjoying high school. I was actually surprised at how well I was functioning and even enjoying life. Having a solid support system was, of course, one of the keys to that. I had and still do have amazing friends and family who carried me through. Page 258, Bob Wolf, my stepdad. When I started to spend time at the house, Randy was a constant presence there. His baseball memorabilia and photography covered the walls. But was, what was most striking were his photos of Xander and Graham. Not only was I literally seeing the two of you through Randy's eyes, but I was also seeing the two of you looking at him. So incredibly loving, heartfelt, and beautiful. At that time, because of your age difference, I ended up spending more time with you, Xander, and Graham. You looked so sad. I so badly wanted to hug you, but also knew that that was just about the worst thing I could ever do. So I left you CDs to listen to, which I think was easier for you to tolerate. Goo told me that Randy sent me to take care of Eileen. As I developed friendships with Randy's friends, they gave even greater life to him. The friends I had prior to my meeting your mom would ask me if I was ever jealous or uncomfortable about Randy, but I never was. I'm not exactly sure why. Not even when the TV would turn itself on in the middle of the night, tune into a Yankees game, and then he would laugh and say, oh, it's just Randy visiting. Page 260, My grief is private, always a work in progress, and it will never be finished. I began to grieve while your dad was alive. Our friends and family have been the best, um, and we talk about him whenever. 
secret altogether. <laughs> when people remark that I did a great job raising my boys alone, I know that that's very far from the truth. It was your dad and me together in the Page 274, Bruce Weinrad, my neighbor. From the time our oldest daughter began playing softball until our youngest daughter graduated from middle school, 12 years in total, I was a softball coach. I coached two teams which kept me on the field six days per week. The girls ranged in age from 7 to 14 years old. I coached hundreds of girls. Still get greeted with high coach by them or their parents when we meet in town. Coaching girls is a unique joy. Not simply because they are adorable, but because of their superior ability over boys to keep games in perspective. Make no mistake, these girls played to win, but they were able to leave it on the field when the game ended. I taught them how to throw, how to swing, how to slide, about, about the nuanced rules of baseball and softball. But mostly I attempted to have fun, encourage them to take one step further than they believed they could, and taught them what it meant to be part of a team. The last goal, teaching teamwork, took a new dimension in the spring of 2000. The season began with our annual trip to the barn and wagon road camp where the equipment was stored. I would get there as early as possible to grab the best bats and the least beat up catching gear, and then lug four duffels of equipment down to my old station wagon. But that year, the excitement of the new season was tempered by the devastating loss of my dear friend Randy months before. Randy was the equipment manager of all of Chappaqua Little League. He would spend hours in that cold, drafty, and dusty barn organizing the gear. Equipment day was always long and exhausting for Randy. But he made it easy for all the coaches. With his great sense of humor, an easygoing manner. He even made it enjoyable. But that year I struggled as I collected my equipment. The wound was still too fresh. As was tradition, all the teams gathered on the main field in town for opening their ceremonies. The kids looked great in their brand new uniforms. They had little interest in the festivities, even to get onto the field. But for many of us who had known Randy, it was a special day because the town dedicated the field at Wagon Road Camp in Randy's memory. A plaque was hung on the backstop proclaiming it Randy Massey Field. Randy was instrumental in having the camp allow the town to build a much needed new field there. As the kids raced and turned cartwheels, Eileen, Graham, and Xander accepted the proclamation as those of us who loved Randy gathered around the gazebo and covered our faces with our baseball hats to hide our tears. I have a problem. It was, it was this hat, the one I wrote Randy's initials on, this side, that I wore. Later that week, my team was scheduled to practice at Randy Massafield. I realized that this presented a teachable moment. I jotted down the follow, and I read it every year, the first time one of my teams practiced at Randy Massafield. Hi, today we are playing on Randy Massafield. Do any of you know who Randy Massa was? Does anybody know why this field is named for him? Does anybody know why this is the only field in all of Newcastle that is named for a person? and not just a school or a park that is located in. Randy Massa was my neighbor and my really good friend. Randy was not a great ball player. In fact, he never played at all. He was born with a disease that made it impossible for him to play sports. He was not a coach. He was not an official of our town. He did not pay, he did not pay for the field. So what did Randy do? He took beautiful photos of kids playing ball, and he organized all the equipment we use just over there in that rickety old barn. You see, Randy gave all he could, 
so others could enjoy playing ball. He contributed in the best way he could, so others could succeed. And that's the true meaning of being a teammate. So I want you all to remember this. The only person in our town to have a field named for him was not the best player, or the most powerful person, or the richest guy in town. He was named for the best teammate. That was my friend Randy. And that was my ball. That concludes our meeting. <laughs>